In 1903, the American explorer Samuel Phillips Werner, a veteran of the African continent, was commissioned to conduct a new expedition in the region. This time, his task was quite unusual, to track down pygmies and bring them back to the United States. Pygmies are hunter-gatherer nomads, averaging less than five feet in height, who inhabit equatorial rainforests. Ota Benga was a pygmy from the South Central African forest, in what was formerly called the Congo Free State. His family, along with virtually his entire tribe, were killed during a raid by Belgium troops in search of ivory. Out on a hunt, Ota Benga survived, only to be captured soon after and put on sale in a slave market. On his way up the Kasai River, Werner purchased Otabenga for a pound of salt and a bolt of cloth. The expedition continued upstream in search of more pygmies. A few months later, the explorer successfully returned to the United States with his unique cargo. There were nine pygmies in all. Their destination, the St. Louis World Fair. World Fairs were a characteristic turn of the century event. Showcases of the most recent technological achievements and marvels, which drew enormous audiences. In 1904, St. Louis Fair would offer an added element. Anthropology would be its centrepiece. In the months leading up to the fair, agents like Werner had been dispatched across the globe to assemble representative specimens of all the world's races. Zulus, Eskimos, Ainus, Patagonian Indians, hundreds of so-called primitive natives from distant lands were displayed on the 12,000 acre fairground in simulations of their own habitats alongside the latest achievements of Western civilization. Regardless of the Missouri climate, natives were expected to wear their traditional clothes. Day after day, they repeatedly performed their dances and rituals in situations wrenched from their original context. Olympic-style games were created for competition between the groups of savages. While the audience amused themselves with the shows, scientists measured, tested and examined every aspect of the natives in an intense effort to scientifically document human evolution. Darwinism, together with other more obscure theories, provided the basis for widely accepted racist and white supremacist beliefs. Ranked at the bottom end of the evolutionary scale, pygmies were among the fair's big sensations. Utabenga was a main attraction. Visitors queued for a chance to see his sharply filed teeth. He was the only one out of the group of pygmies that came from a different tribe. Unable to speak the same language, Otabengo was even more isolated. In December 1904, six months after its opening, the St. Louis World Fair came to an end. 18 million people had visited its grounds. For their participation, the nine pygmies were granted a total of $8.35. At the close of the fair, the thousands of human attractions received different fates. Most were sent back to their lands, 
while others remained in the United States, vanishing into its vast interior or becoming sideshows in circuses and amusement parks. Werner went back to Africa to return the pygmies to their tribes. Otabengo remained with him. He joined Werner on his travels and lecture tours around the United States, where the explorer embellished stories on how he saved Otabenga from a cannibal feast, or how the pygmy saved him from poison darts. By mid-1906, Werner's financial reserves were drained. No company or institution seemed interested in hiring him for their African ventures or in purchasing any of his animals or collectibles. His lack of academic credentials and a history of mental breakdowns also made it difficult for him to find work. In New York, drowned in debts, he found a place to store what he referred to as his little fellow, the American Museum of Natural History. Otabenga roamed around the inside of the facilities for a few days until he threw a chair that almost hit the head of one of the museum's important benefactors, Mrs. Florence Guggenheim. <laughs> Werner was called to take back his charge. Still financially broke and unable to sustain Otabenga, he sent the pygmy to the New York Zoological Park as a bonus in a transaction that included a monkey and a snake. Soon after, with no better options, the former explorer and Africanist accepted a position as a night shift ticket agent in the New York subway. Like the scientists in the St. Louis Fair, the Bronx Zoo administrators shared a widely held hierarchical view of races, which ranked the Nordic race at the top. Shortly after Ota Benga's arrival, an article about him appeared in the Zoological Society Bulletin, just before a piece about lizards. For the first few days, he wandered around the zoo grounds, having free access to all cages. After noticing the pygmy's affinity with the monkeys, zoo officials decided on where to house their new acquisition. The next day, newspapers hit the stands with a bizarre headline. Sharing a cage with an orangutan and chimpanzees, Utabenga immediately attracted a crowd at the zoo. At the monkey house, a new sign was posted. Unlike many of the other St. Louis fair attractions, Utabenga was not put on display in a Coney Island freak show, but in a so-called scientific institution. While the zoo directors emphasised the scientific nature of the display, visitors were more amused with what they considered a primitive version of themselves, beyond ape, but not quite human, a missing link. But the attraction didn't please all. The minister was ridiculed by the press, who called him a religious fundamentalist, incapable of accepting Darwin's theories of evolution, and Ota Benga as a clear example of man's descent from the apes. The clergyman persisted. The pygmy continued to attract crowds to the zoo. 
40,000 people on a single Sunday. Ota Benga became hostile. The black ministers gained supporters. The zoo decided to get rid of the controversial exhibit, declaring the pygmy unmanageable and dangerous. They no longer wanted Ota Benga. On September the 27th, with Werner's authorization, Ota Benga was transferred to the Howard Coloured Orphan Asylum in Brooklyn. He was approximately 28 years old. His name disappeared from the headlines. Ota Benga spent three years in the orphanage before moving to the south. In Virginia, he received the support of the Lynchburg Seminary and made his living by working in a tobacco factory and odd jobs. In 1916, ten years after leaving the zoo, he shot himself in the chest. Werner's experience with malaria earned him a medical position in the construction of the Panama Canal. When informed of Ota Benga's death, he lamented the loss of his brave little fellow. William Hornaday, the Bronx Zoo director, concluded that Ota Benga would rather die than work for a living. In a piece about Ota Benga's death, the New York Times contradicted all of its previous articles about the pygmy, declaring them as unfounded reports and describing Ota Benga as employed in the zoological park. In 1999, the Bronx Zoo launched the opening of a Congo exhibit. Upon requests for copies of Ota Benga's pictures held in the zoo archives, they were declared not available. Additional requests for an explanation were not answered.